Welcome everybody to The Leader Equation. I'm Lindsay Soprani, CEO of Soprani Consulting and the Lindsay Soprani team. We're the top recruiting and consulting firm in the country for real estate. And then I'm here with my lovely co-host, Christy Belt Grossman, who is the CEO of Ops Boss Coaching, the ultimate resource for training and coaching for real estate ops bosses. So welcome to The Leader Equation. Today, we are super excited. We've got, um, we've got David Osborne and his chief of staff, Matt King with us and they're going to talk all things leadership and what this awesome relationship looks like because they're doing it at a really high level so we're really excited about that but first before I do that I'm going to pass it over to Christy and she's going to take them through our quick fire questions so we can get to know them a little bit better. Before we do the quick fire why don't you guys each introduce yourself and just kind of give us a general idea of what your roles are. I know David you have so many businesses that, that could take the whole hour but you can uh, give us give us the overview. Yeah, sure. So my name is David Osborne. I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, I've been at Keller Williams for years, got very lucky. I got the Keller Williams uh, opportunity at a very young age. Um, I like to create businesses and help other people succeed with me and beside me. And um, I've done a ton of real estate transactional business. I have a private equity real estate based firm and I have a very large residential real estate practice that sells $12 billion worth of Sales run by my great partner, Smokey Garrett in Dallas, Texas. Awesome. My, my name is Matt King. Uh, helped David run his world. I've been a part of it for about four and a half years now. I was born and raised in Wisconsin. Started my first company when I was 18. Decided to print t-shirts. Um, girlfriend decided we were going to move to Washington, D.C. So we went out east and spent a couple of years there and then have been in Austin for almost five years now. Love it. Love that you have an entrepreneurial background a little bit. That always helps when you're working for a serial entrepreneur. So, okay, quick fire questions. David, year one, did you have a profit or loss in business? Yeah, I would have lost money in year one. I mean, yeah, for sure the business lost money. I was also selling, so I made it up in sales. Okay. And then this year, your projected profit across all your businesses will be what? Probably 20 something million profit. I got partners, so that doesn't all go into my pocket, but that would be my estimate. That's awesome. Super healthy businesses. Um, how many were on your team or in your business year one? And how many people are you leading across all your businesses now? Year one was two people. And today, if you count the agents who really I work for, they, they don't work for me. I'm their employee. And there's, there's about 5,200 approximately people in that. If you add the regions all up together, it's probably more like 30,000. But again, awesome. those are independent contractors that are part of yeah, but you're, you're, you're still leading. So I love that. Okay. So quick, uh, this, this, I know you've written a book about this. So morning routine tips, what's your morning routine that somebody could learn something from? Yeah. The, you win the morning to win the day. So if I get up early, um, I'm, which I almost always do, then I'm journaling, reading, looking at my goals, um, ideally meditating and praying, and then ideally jumping on my stationary, my Peloton bike, for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and then attacking the day. So if I can get those things done in the morning, is you know, silence, affirmation, visualization, exercise, reading, and scribing, as we call it in the miracle morning, then I'm I, I never lose a day where I get those six things in first. Love that. Matt, are you doing the same thing or something? Yeah, I, I do the same as much as I can. I wake up uh, early. First thing I always do is exercise. The one the one area I'm probably not as strong as David at is scribing. He's a really good journaler and I'm trying to work on that, but I always try to start the day reading, kind of going through the day in my head, what I got coming up and uh, always try to make time to exercise right away. Awesome. And then preparation for tomorrow. Any tips for your evening routine? Yeah, I keep telling Hal he needs to write the miracle evening uh, for millionaires or whatever. <laughs> miracle evening. Um, you know, mostly for me, it's getting to bed early and not too much screen time. You know, I try to have a family dinner. Um, rest is the key. Uh, I don't really think too much about the next day. I, I, you know, there's no point in reading it in the evening and the morning. It's not that complicated for me. Back in the day when I was, when every meeting was more important, I would go to sleep visualizing my appointments of the next day and sort of imagining myself. Let's say I'm meeting a banker at noon. I would see myself walking into the bank with power and personal presence and sitting down being charismatic and, you know, run through some of the things I had to do or recruiting appointments, which I did a bunch of. Um, I still sometimes do that in the morning if I have a big meeting coming up, but in the evening, it's really about slowing down early, getting rest, low sugar, low to no sugar, low to no alcohol, no screen, low to no screen time, reading a book, chilling out and getting a good night's sleep. 
I love that. I want to ask you a question about visualization. I'm going off track here, which was sort of the theme of our show usually. When I do visualization, I usually am visualizing that same meeting. I'd be visualizing myself walking out after I've accomplished what my mission was on that meeting and what it feels like and sounds like and tastes like. Why are you visualizing that you're visualizing the opposite? I love that. Well, first off, your strategy is brilliant. Uh, I learned it from Tony Robbins. Tony used to say, imagine a circle of a color, like I'd always choose blue. So a blue circle right in front of the door before you walk in and then see yourself being present, capable, you know, con contributory, fully alive. And so that's all the process I've ever done. Uh, your idea is pretty brilliant. I do kind of visualize things as if they've gone my way in a different way, but not generally on a specific meeting. Just in general in life, I see things going my way every day and, you know, getting better and better in all ways and being a great father, great husband, great businessman, keeping in great physical shape. So I do a lot of that, but as specifically on meetings, I've never thought of seeing um, myself exit with the win. That's a very smart way to do it. Okay. Book that impacted you guys the most, each of you. Uh, think and Grow Rich probably, but most recently maybe, um, uh, what's the one with the integrator in it? Uh, Rocket Fuel. Rocket, Rocket Fuel. Fuel. Yeah. For our relationship, yeah. Rocket Fuel. Yeah. Uh, mine was probably As a Man Thinketh. Oh, okay. He was going to say Wealth Can't Wait. Yeah. And yes. then right <laughs> or, or Miracle Morning Millionaires or Tribal Millionaires. Or Tribal Millionaires, right. <laughs> By the way, those of you who are listening, we'll post the links in the comments yeah. for all the books um, that you can buy that David's written because they're awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, how many streams of income do each of you have? You know your number? I don't know. He has, he has about 107 <laughs> if we count his single family homes and the entities that they're held. It's about 205 if we count them all individually. Yeah. I think I have four right now, and most of those are either from David or investments I've gotten into because of David. Love that. And final question is what is, you can either answer what your superpower is or what the other person's superpower is. You know, Matt is, uh, Matt doesn't flinch. That's my, my, that's his superpower. Whether he's got a, beat, you know, uh, Goliath with a slingshot, or he's got to change my kid's diapers. There's just not anything he thinks is beneath him. He doesn't, you know, he just sucks. He just goes, he doesn't, there's not even a flinch. Like some guys be like, oh, I guess to make my boss happy, the dog crapped on the carpet, I'll clean up the dog crap, but he doesn't just, it's just taken care of. There's not a thing that high or low reading legal documents, negotiating with employees, negotiating transactions, uh, Matt doesn't flinch. He's Matt the flinchless. Matt the flinchless. That's good. That's All right, awesome. Matt, what's David's superpower? I would say David's is get to action. Like I, what, one of the things that I love most about David is just how quickly he gets to action. He doesn't really waste any time thinking about what would happen or how it would happen. He's just, how can we take action? How can we take action now and just keep taking action? That's awesome. So for those of you who are listening for the first time, we're chatting with David Osborne and Matt King. We're chatting with entrepreneurs and their shotgun leaders inside and outside real estate about what adds to the leadership formula, what subtracts, what divides, most importantly, what multiplies your results. I'm gonna throw it back to Lindsay so we can dig into the meat of the questions because we have a ton of questions I know from our listeners. Yes, well, I have, I've been fortunate enough to be in rooms where David got to speak about you, Matt. I already told you that. And your relationship was just, it was one that I was like, oh my gosh, if we could get them on there, they would have so much to be able to share with people. And so, you know, just walk us through really quickly. You know, we kind of just heard that Matt doesn't flinch. He's going to do anything and everything. And I mean, what does that life look like? What is your top 20% of like, this is my main job, Matt? Yeah. So for me, like my number one thing is making sure David's life is easy and continues to go in the direction he wants to go. So I'm looking at his journals constantly, his email, most of his communication, and always trying to be aware of what David's working on and what David wants. And everything I do on a daily basis is to make sure we're moving in that direction. Um, and we're continuing to, to move in that direction always. Um, we might have to switch from time to time, but I usually either hear it from him or kind of see it ahead of time, whether it's through his journaling or through his emails of where we need to go and just constantly making sure we're moving there. So what that. advice would you have? We, we have a lot of people listening where there's executive assistants, directors of operations, as well as entrepreneurs and business owners. I think there's a lot of focus on training people on how to do and not as much focus on training people how to think. And what I'm getting from you is that you really understand how David thinks. What advice would you give people for how to accelerate that process of learning how their visionary thinks? Yeah, I would give more advice to the visionary. 
David is an open book. There is not a single thing that he hides. There's not, I mean, he is just lives in a glass house and it makes my job really easy. I talked to a lot of other people in similar roles to me. And one of the things that makes it hard for them is that they never really know what their, their boss or their visionary is thinking or doing because he guards certain types of communication or they don't have access to his email or he doesn't talk to them. David is just like constantly communicating, like just text, email, whatever it is. And so if I can see most of those things, I'm, I'm always aware of what's going on and he doesn't have to stop, communicate with me, keep me in the loop. He can just keep living his life. Love well, that. and that's something that David, was that something you learned like a long time ago that was like, you know what, I have to be super transparent. Have you always been that way? No, I definitely haven't always been that way. I had a lot of issues early on. I've had a lot of really good, you know, executive assistants over my career and some bad ones too. But early on, I, I noticed I would, I would ask somebody to do something, but I wouldn't give them the authority or I would, you know, I would be the bottleneck. I, I used to be a bottleneck where everything had to run through me. So instead of empowering people, I was like, yeah, 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 just go negotiate the lease and then put it on my desk and I'll give it the final say so or get me that paperwork on that deal and then put it on my desk. And then I noticed like things weren't getting done and it was all sitting on my desk. And, you know, I'm not likely to read that lease that I said I wanted to have on my desk. I really, so I've learned to let go. And obviously someone has to earn that right. And Matt's earned that 10 times over. And, it, and so I used to delegate, but not give authority, which is a terrible thing to do. And then I would have conflict with people. Um, I've learned to um, keep all my goals written down and share them with Matt and let him go through my journals, you know, ask him to look at my goals as I set them and hold, you know, hold me accountable or just schedule them. Like if it says 12 yoga sessions, then he'll just book them. He says, by the way, Wednesday, you're going to yoga. The more I can, you know, I'm looking for speed. If I can go fast um, without drag, I'm going to get to where I want to go faster. And Matt sort of by, by taking that one step of me saying, Hey Matt, book me a yoga or Hey Matt, he just does it. He shows that initiative. Matt's a pretty special character in that he was an entrepreneur before. So he really gets it at, at the highest level ever. But also the other thing I used to do, I remember, and maybe this is what some people struggle with. I used to lie to my assistant when I go play golf. Like I was embarrassed that I wasn't working. So I remember early on, I'd be like, Hey, I've got an appointment this afternoon. I wouldn't tell them, mm. Hey, I'm just going to go play golf because I felt awkward, not working, even though they didn't, you know, the, the executive or the right-hand man never, they never see the, Saturday all night where you didn't sleep because you're stressing about a deal or the Sunday. And for some reason in my mind, I had to pretend I was working all the time to justify my position. So I got over that in, in waves over years, like shedding skin. And now I'm completely free of it, or at least 99% free of it. Um, and Matt really helps that because he's just like, I just want your life to be easy. I want, you know, Matt wins through me winning and whatever that victory looks like. That's where Matt finds his wins. And that's pretty unique. You, you want to find that in a person. Um, you know, other mistakes I've made in the past was I used to have a million ideas that I would think out loud and um, it was too much. I had one executive assistant who was a master's degree in administration. She was brilliant, but I just, I'd start talking to her and she would just burst into tears because I would just be brainstorming, but she was hearing like 20 things that had to be each one. And so I've learned to sort of like narrow my aperture to more focus on, on fewer things versus a wider focus. Um, let's see. I, don't I think that's a huge one for people listening. I, Lindsay and I both coach, we see that all the time where you're just, you're thinking out loud, all your brainstorm, it's just coming out, like it's a visual into your brain coming out your mouth. And the EA is like, thinking I just got a to-do list that's 17 days long that needs to be done by tomorrow when you don't even want 15 of the 17 things done. Yeah, I've had EAs in the past. And even Matt, this has happened with us before where they've handed me something that I said in passing like 90 days earlier, like, here's that report you're asking. I'm like, what is this? You know, what? And it looks like it took hours to create. So I'm trying to, I try to be way more careful than I used to be. It's, it's way easier too with success. When I, I was really probably much snappier when I was climbing the mountain than now that I'm, I'm still climbing mountains, but I don't, it's not life and death like it was. Right. When things went wrong. I was kind of probably pretty crabby and critical. Um, I still can be in the heat of battle. If things go badly, I can, and I've really learned to manage that too. Like, you know, the seagull method where you just fly in and dump on people is what I used to do. Uh, sea, seagull man method of management. That's just, it's just not acceptable really. And so I've kind of, learn to filter how I roll. And, and what's great about Matt is he takes things. When I hired him, I said, 
he said, what's my job description? I said, just look over my shoulder, find out what's getting done and take it off of me. But yeah, when I was, I was way more private when I started, I, I, Matt will email people and I use as if it's me. And I used to not let any of that happen. I wanted every word myself, which meant my inbox was just blowing out and I couldn't get to it all. Now, generally, unless it's super critical things, um, he'll just answer people. But if it's super critical, he'll, he'll take a draft and say, hey, it's in your drafts, or he'll just, dic I'll dictate and he'll take it down. When I hung out with Richard Branson and he was with his right hand woman, um, he doesn't write a single one of his emails. He has bad dyslexia, I understand. So he just dictates. And that was a big aha for me because I saw that, I modeled it, I brought it home until that moment, which was three or three years ago or so. I still had my emails and I let Matt look at them. Now he has them all. I don't even really, I, I, I see them on my phone, but I don't try to answer them. I let Matt handle them and I'll dictate something if it's like, you know, Gary Keller or something super, super critical. What How do you long were you in with business together before you were able to let go of that? You know, I always say people got to earn the right and they, they, you'd be foolish to just give over your life to somebody. Right, but if right. you give over your life with awareness or with observation, you give bits. And then as they prove how good they are at it, you know, then they step into more and they step into more. And it's just like anyone, if you hire a guy to run sales for your real estate company, they're going to have a ceiling. And, you know, I'm still waiting to find what Matt's ceiling is, but they're going to have a ceiling of sales. And when they hit it, you're like, okay, I either need to add another person or get somebody better than the person I've hired, right? Um, so with Matt, I just gave him stuff, observed how he handled it, gave him more stuff, observed how he handled it. And he just kept, you know, taking stuff off of me. So he had a higher and higher ceiling. I have had a past, the one right before Matt, who was also a great executive assistant. She just didn't really love it. You know, you could tell her heart wasn't in it. I've never got the sense once that Matt is not interested in his job, enjoying himself, she enjoyed parts of it, but it was a part of her life. Matt, Matt and I are building something together. He's as much in it as I am. And, um, you know, when I win, Matt wins. I put Matt in my will. That's how close we've become just because I want him to hit certain economic goals. And if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, then that wouldn't be very doable. So I've got him in the will. But, you know, in answer to your original question, I, I just cracked open the door and gave him this much. He crushed it. I gave him the next piece. He crushed it. I gave him the next piece. And yes, there were bumps, but the bumps were usually like, hey, when you answer that email, I wouldn't say dude to that guy. I don't know them that well. I'd say, sir, <laughs> I mean, this guy I'd say dude to you. Why did you say sir to him? I've known him 20 years, right? So it was like copying my language. And still to this day, because he's a little different than me, he'll answer something. I'm like, oh, that's a little colder than I would have been in that circumstance. But, um, you know, it's just letting Matt own that piece of the, of the universe that I'm involved in. Well, and that's a part that people have a really hard time letting go of, right? Like, so when there is that mistake or, you know, that thing that happens, that's like, Hey, I'd maybe do that differently. Like what were the responses from you and how did you kind of tame yourself? Like, was there ever a big mistake? Well, you know, you'd have to tell me, was there ever a big mistake? I mean, I probably make big mistakes all the time. I think, you know, David, he's very direct with his feedback, which I appreciate, but I also don't take things very personal. So I think I'm able to just kind of roll with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at it, you know, the reason he's spending time telling me what he would have done is because he wants us to get better. And so I'm always trying to just think that way. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of times where I'll say, Hey, I wouldn't have done that. Or next time let's do this. Or why would you say that? And you know, I'll go through my logic and he'll be like, well, that's interesting point of view, but how about this? And he'll present something as well. So for but me, if, it's just never personal. If I'm in a middle seat, three hour flight in economy, oh, yeah. I'm going to be like, Hey, what the, yeah. you know, I'm, why am I on this plane? Yeah. You know, and it'll be short, sharp and like, never put me in this situation right. again. Or, you know, or little things like that. Um, but Matt does take it incredibly well. He's not. You know. Is that something that comes naturally to you, Matt? Or is that something you had to learn in the shotgun role? So I think it's something that's come natural to me just through my life. I was, when I was younger, I was always like the, the little guy. And so I always had to like face adversity in sports and stuff. And I just learned to ignore the, ignore the critics and just look for the actual feedback that was going to serve me. And so I try not to take things personal. Um, you know, I, I know I'm going to make mistakes and that's life. And, you know, I feel bad when I make mistakes, but I feel worse if I make the same mistake again. So I just learn from it and try not to do it again. Well, that's something we coach on so often because I think, you know, especially an executive assistant or somebody in an ops role, you know, when that feedback comes, they're not looking at it that way, right? They're looking at it as like, oh, I made a mistake. And then there's all of this, like all this meaning around it, right? Which is the meaning that we're placing around that thing. But I mean, I think it's amazing that you were in the beginning, even able to just move past and reframe that and say, you know what, 
this is what I'm learning from that. And so how much quicker did you guys become a team because of that? I'm sure that that was like an immediate like bonding thing for you guys to be able to have that, you know, easy feedback and move and pivot in the right direction. Well, all of that, Lindsay, also comes from business, right? So you get yeah. kicked in the teeth so many times by business. Mm -hmm. and in the beginning, you take it personally, right? So I was talking to someone earlier today. I think I got sued for $15,000 by a copier company when I was first in business in 97. And it just kept me up at night and it was stressful and it could have been a $50,000 loss. Anyway, we ended up settling it and working out for like $7,500. But I remember that was like 90 days of hell or whatever. It just bugged the hell out of me. But I was also 29 years old. I got slapped by a $2 million frivolous lawsuit in, you know, in my opinion, six months ago. And I haven't really barely thought about it. Like it doesn't, that's, that's business, you know, over 25 years. And, and Matt has that, he brought it into the relationship, but it's the same, you know, I think it's harder when you're newer because the, the wounds hurt more. It's like, it's like the first breakup, you know, you feel suicidal. And then by the, by the time you're through college, you get rejected all the time or whatever. You're like, Hey, whatever, that's just what's next. And I think that's how business is too. You've got to learn to really be quick to resolve that either personally or not personally. What Matt and I both do is we both look out for the other. So I, he knows that I've got his interests at heart. I know he's got my interests at heart. It's a covenant relationship. He's probably the closest relationship I have outside of my wife in my life, honestly. If I, if my plane crashed or if I got killed tomorrow, I, I would know that my family would be OK because Matt would be there to take care of him and walk him through all the, cra the crazy stuff that I've created. And without Matt, that would be incredibly hard. Um, and at the same time, that's how I look out. Yeah, that's how he looks out for me. All I could do is put him in my will. So he knew that, like, we've got co-goals together, give him raises, uh, believe in him. And, uh, you know, I think he got pretty snappy with me one time because I was dismissive of an economic goal that he had. So we did have a little conflict over that. Um, so I just got to keep believing in Matt and, you know, I know he believes in me. So that's kind of how we work together. But it, again, what the dance you see with us is only a dance because I've had a bunch of dance past partners in the past who were at varying levels of skill and I've been a crappy dancer, but now I'm a much better dancer. So I, I get it now. And I, I yeah, uh, it, I don't I don't hold Matt accountable to hours that he works. I don't look over his shoulder on his days off. I never ask any of that stuff. His license plate when he drove down from DC was all in, right? All out, yeah. All out, all out. So Matt plays all out and it feels like he's all in. And because he's all in, there's no need to micromanage him. If you got to micromanage somebody, you just got another problem. And going back to what you said earlier, the reason people can't live this way is the reason I live this way is because I want scale. I want a massive life, right? There's not a billionaire in the world that doesn't have someone like Matt King covering for them. And, and by the way, if that billionaire tried to micromanage that person, they wouldn't be a billionaire. Because if you stay stuck in the small stuff, you can't expand, expand your world to a big size. And I had to learn that early on when I was the bottleneck or trying to do other people's jobs for them. You know, even running a business, if you hire that salesperson and you then micromanage them to death, you just kept their job. You hired somebody and you had two jobs, half theirs and the rest yours. What you really need to do is let them sink or swim on their own, come to you for advice, and then your life can get bigger because you can hire three or four salespeople. And that's really what I have with Matt. And he's just, I've just never found his ceiling yet. Now he's reviewing legal documents. He knows how he talks to my lawyers for me. I don't have to get involved. Like even that lawsuit, I don't think it, probably I'm sleeping well at night because he's sleeping badly because he's the one that's talking to all the lawyers and finding out what's going on. I'm like, do you need me? That's all I ever say. Do you need me on this? He's like, no, I don't need you. I'll let you know what I do. And that's it. So uh, he does so that in so many different listening areas. listening right now, you, I love that you owned that your growth has not just been because you got a better dance partner, but because you weren't being a good dance partner. What would you tell people listening now that can help them become better dance partners with their, with their integrator? Well, trust, first off, very value them, under, trust but verify. So in other words, I have complete faith in Matt. My verification is just to get feedback from him. So it's quite often we'll be on the phone for an hour or something. I'll just be running through all the stuff on the top of my head. Um, don't micromanage, delegate and let go, but just observe. So you can see what's going on, but don't jump in and try to tell them to do it differently or better. You can give them direct feedback, like why was I in middle seat and coach, but don't then say, now I need a whole new system for how we're going to fly. Just tell them right away. Let them design the systems. Gary Keller is a billionaire coach of mine. He said, you don't have a systems problem. You have a people problem. Hire the people and have them develop the systems. And um, yeah.
So let's ask this question because this is actually one that we haven't been able to ask on this. And it's something that Christy and I get all the time. You know, how much does somebody like Matt cost? Everybody always wants to get these people for like $40,000 and wants them to work all the time. And Matt, you potentially could talk to this too, but it's crazy to me because, you know, if you really want good help, you have to invest in the good help. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we hired him at 70. Is that right? Yeah. He moved me here for 25,000 bucks a year. I was working for some other people as well. And I had my own little business. So it was just like, Hey, I think I've got an opportunity to move to Austin. Give me 25% of your time. I'll pay you 25,000 bucks. And it was slowly ticked up the first salary I got from David was 75,000. Um, but I've had to earn it and prove my way. And I wasn't, you know, coming out of the gate saying, pay me a million bucks a year. It was, you know, prove it, earn it, prove it, earn it kind of a thing. Yeah. He was a shared employee at first by mm -hmm. like three guys, right? Yeah. Rock, mm -hmm. Pat and me. Yep. Or Go, Go Abundance, you and Pat. me and Pat. Mm -hmm. So that's where he, I thought that was 25 each 75, but I could be wrong. And then he had his own thing on the side. Um, you know, and, and I pay him a lot more now. Um, but I've done, you, you've got to pay for it. Matt makes, I don't know whether he wants to tell you that or not, but I, I'm not going to answer for him, but it's deep yeah. in the six figures now. Um, and that's just been me grateful for the amount he does. I mean, he really has taken such a, a load off my shoulders. I, I had to ask myself the other day. Now he's been with me four years. And I think when was the, the big raise was the beginning of this year. When was it? Yeah, ago. it was like six months ago. Six months ago. I gave him a Eight really pretty mm -hmm. significant raise. Um, almost a double. Yeah, almost remember. a double, just, almost just a double. under a double. Mm -hmm. But I had to ask myself, like, if Matt got, you know, if Matt was gone, what would that mean to me? And I had to, and I'm lucky again, I make a lot of money, but um, I realized that even though I've got income earners that make me money that I can track, okay, that guy, I paid him, you know, 500,000, he made me a million. I can track that. I can't track that with Matt because he doesn't do that. He's not an income generator, but the value to me of Matt um, was so high that I could have gone up 50%. He'd have probably been happy, but I went up almost hundred um, percent because I want this relationship to, to be forever. Um, the other thing I tell you though, to go back to your earlier question, when I heard, I hired my first great assistant, in 1996-ish, uh, mm -hmm. I was only making $100,000 a year yep. and I was budgeting $25,000. Now there's been inflation since then. So I was trying to hire someone at 25. I found somebody that I really liked at 45. So I went ahead and paid them 45 and I cut, I took a pay cut, you know, to get that person. So I was barely making more than they were, you know, uh, and that, but that person changed my life. I, I really, you've got to pay these people but you've got to verify that they're doing the stuff where there's no, some people you pay and then they kind of take advantage and they get sloppy. That's not what you're looking for. You're, and this, this lady I hired had, had been in an administrator for 300 doctors. She was great. I mean, she was very driven. And every time I'd ask her to do something, I'd have her create a one pager on what she'd done, whether it was putting on a summit or doing a recruiting package. So I built an operations manual based on her, her giving me that feedback. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge she had is she was so aggressive that she started to sit at the head of the table, started to run the meetings started to act like she was me. So that she was like an extreme aggressive person. So the relationship only lasted two years, but she really took my organizational structure to a different level. Um, and I don't know why I told you that, but you, you, they, they, the people have to win through you like that. Right. They have to A, be driven, be very highly competent and then win through you. If they start thinking, oh, I can take all his ideas and do better. Or why does he make so much money? There's something... I think called like you're near the money. So you think it's your money like syndrome. And I've seen this happen to people before. They're like, yeah, I know the marketplace for my skills is 75, but you're making 3 million bucks a year. So you should be paying me at least 300,000. That's not true. No. If the market's 75 and you're getting a hundred, that's a good deal. Okay. Um, so that's a, I've seen that. And that's happened to me a few times too. And I don't blame people. Like mm -hmm. it's probably not fair the amount of money I make, but I make that money and it's not relative. What I make is not relative to, you know, your, your role has got to be based more on the marketplace and, and then just show up and commit and commit and do and do and do. And you'll, your value will go up because of that commitment. I also created a deal with Matt where I don't know, he's, we haven't done a great job of executing this. I said, you can look back on any deal I've done one year or two years, two years, two years. So you can go back two years and put up to 10 grand in a deal. So if I had a deal that was up 12 X, he could go back and put 10 grand into that deal two years backwards. Does that make sense? That's so awesome. Trying to find ways for him to win creatively. Right. Well, and that's in, you know, I'm sure Christy's getting ready to ask this question too. You know, so many people, Matt, just to go back to you to pivot on this, so many people 
they're so afraid to like take a position like you did and prove themselves in order to get it because they feel like, well, I know my worth. I know who I am. And like, this is what I'm worth. But I mean, that has worked out very well for you, correct? Yeah, it has. I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big athlete. And so I've always been on teams. And so I'm a big believer that if, you know, I'm the water boy on the New England Patriots and David's Tom Brady and we win the Super Bowl, I get a ring too. And I don't really need to be the guy on stage with all the confetti and all that stuff around me. I just want to be on the winning team and put myself and my family in the best position possible to win. And, and that's been in David's world. And I think why we work so well together is because I, we have this covenant relationship where I am always looking out for him, but he's doing the same for me. I mean, I tell my wife all the time, if something happens to me, just go to David, he'll help, he'll help you. He'll figure it out. So, I mean, it's just, it's really cool to have. And I mean, he, he married us, his daughter was our flower girl. So like, I'm all in for him. I'm all in a part of his family and he's the same for me. Can I just dig into that? The teacher in me is wanting this teaching moment right now, mm -hmm. because I think there's a lot of people listening who don't know the difference between covenant and contract. And the fact that you both have said this is a covenant relationship is the strongest statement I've ever heard on this podcast. And I would love to hear you guys tell us what that means. Well, for me, it means that I expect to be the keynote speaker at Matt's funeral. I, I expect to be a pallbearer for him. I expect to, you know, be there making the speech about what a wonderful man he was and, you know, how sad it is that he died at 80 while I'm 110 years old. Um, I plan to be in his life, you know, it, as long as it keeps working out forever. It's a forever thing. It's if, if his, if his kid breaks a leg, then my kid broke a leg. If his, you know, car gets wrecked and my car get wrecked it's not there's not a there's not really a distinction Matt's like an adopted son almost that's kind of how I look at it and that was supposed to be a joke that I was gonna I'm way older than him so he'll you know we, we <laughs> that. I was telling him I'll speak at his funeral what an amazing because I plan how on and did you know that you had entered into a covenant relationship yeah not right away you never know right away I knew he was good I mean it, it's like anything um if someone just keeps looking after you, you fall in love with them. That's the bottom line. And Matt's just always looked out for me, my family, my wife, my kids. Uh, and I've fallen in love with a guy. So as long as we don't F that up somehow, you know, and, and I don't see that happening really. So if, so I, I would say, how long did it take? I knew he was really special for a while, but probably not until maybe even when I just doubled his salary. I mean, it, it was just been growing, like give, being in a, involved in his wedding was beautiful. I've always, I'm also always aware that he might rise up and find an opportunity where he wants to go be the CEO of something. And hopefully we do it together. And if he goes and does it without me, I'm okay with that too. It's um, but the, I think you just keep doing for someone and the gratitude just grows and uh, Matt's always there. So this distinctive moment of when in four years, I don't know when, I don't know. I, I remember early on when I started working for David, it was probably like six or eight months into the, into the relationship. I uh, met him downtown. I think I had to pick up his car. His wife was coming. Something happened and we were sitting at a restaurant. And he said like, what's your goals long-term? And I looked at him and I said, my goal is to be in the room where you're, where you're dying, like be next to you on your deathbed. And he jokes about it, but he did look at me and say, but I'm going to probably outlive you. So I'll be <laughs> here. So I mean, like for, from me, from that moment on, I knew it was like, yeah, it might've been a little bit of a joke, but I also knew that meant something to him and I meant what I was saying. And so, I mean, for me, it was ever since kind of that moment. So a question came in from somebody to, um, I guess we could ask both of you, but I'll start with David, that you're a servant leader. I would guess the answer is probably yes. Yeah, of course. How do you serve Matt? Hmm. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in Matt's long-term financial security. I mean, that's, that's, that's something I care about a lot. So we were looking at flips recently and he probably tells the story better than I do, but a flip came in. How many years ago was that? I don't even remember. <laughs> um, anyway, a flip three came years. in two years. How yeah, long have you been in your house? I've been, uh, it's been three, three years. So a flip came a across my like desk yeah. and I was like, this doesn't work for me, but Matt, you need to buy it. Mm -hmm. So I called Matt up. You tell the story. Yeah. So we were in California and uh, David's wife called him. We were, he was, she was on the car phone and yeah, it was probably three and a half years ago already. And, and she was like, Oh, I think I want to buy this house. It's a great rental. And David flies through the numbers with her and he puts the phone on mute. He goes, that's a terrible house for her to buy. But why aren't you buying that house? And I said, like, oh, I don't know. I haven't even seen it. My wife hasn't seen it. He unmuted the phone. He said, Tracy, mom will take Matt's fiance at the time to go look at the house this week. Matt should buy this house. It's not a good rental. And I remember calling my wife and I'm like, Hey, I think we might have to buy a house. I'm, I don't know 
how it is. I'm sorry. And she literally told me probably two weeks ago, like, we're so lucky we bought this house and listened to David and Althea and Tracy at the time, because now we're in a great area. We have a little, a little daughter. It's in a perfect area to have a family and it's probably gone up to 30% since we bought it. Yeah. And they, I also remember at one point, I think I had to call you and be like, why the hell haven't you gone to look at the house? Yeah. Yeah. No, that was in like, California. He was like, like, why the hell have you gone to look at the house? Because it was off market. Yeah. It was a red hot market then. Yeah. And I was there. He's like, well, I'm not sure Melissa, what, wanted to go see it without yeah. you? Or well, yeah. Something. He's like, I'm like, yeah. just go look at the house. You're yeah. buying this house. Yeah. You yeah. have to buy this house. No it wasn't question. an option. It was like, you are buying this house. Just figure it, just go look at the house. And so I, we were in California at the time and I, I remember calling my, my fiance. I was like, oh yeah, you have to go look. And I know you don't know David's mom, but she's really sweet. She'll show you the house. And she just moved here. Yeah, we had just moved here. And so it was like, just buy the house. And, and we did, and we just listened to it. And, and I didn't that give was a second on that house. <laughs> that was one of the moments where I knew like too, he was looking out for us because he could have easily said, yeah, Tracy, let's buy that house. Knowing that it didn't pencil out as a rental, he knew the, the area was going to appreciate well. But he just said, no, you, you do it. You need to buy that. So another thing is he had this like stupid BMW that had like a knock. So Take it would it, like yeah. knock, 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 knock. So uh, <laughs> when I wanted to bonus him after the first or before the house or after the house, I don't remember. It was after the house, like the first year, first full year. Mm -hmm. So I just went and prepaid a 36 month lease on a forerunner. And I just, one day I gave it to him. So he mm -hmm. got to show up and there was a forerunner for him so that he could get rid of the Tick, 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 car. That's awesome. And he still has the car. Yeah, I still have it. So that, that's just, it's just like, I look for Matt's, the little things I think I can help him with, um, and then just put him in them. Like, so there's, he's, and I'm not, you know, there, that's it. So I'm good at finances. That's really my thing. I can't advise him on how to be a better husband. He's probably better than me at that, or as good as me at that already. And being a dad and all the rest of it. But if I see anything, I'll tell him, like, I told him you're stupid to run all these marathons and, you know, mm -hmm. he's, I don't think it's healthy. And he's, he ran the last one and had a broken blood ankle. blister and a broken ankle. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just <laughs> the little things like there's only so much I can do. Right. Um, but I do consider him like family. And if, if he wins, I win. Same thing. And, and to elaborate on your question, he's always serving me. He'll ask me every day, do you want a coffee? Do you want lunch? Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm heating up soup. Can I heat you up some soup? He'll, and there's days where he'll walk out and carry my lunch bag. Like, Hey, let me grab that from you. And he'll just carry it and walk me to that car. Say, have, have a great weekend. Have a great night. He's, he's a very servant oriented person. I mean, he's always looking for ways to serve others. Um, and, and it just shows in everything he does. Yeah. We look out for one another. It's a pretty, you know, but again, it's still, it's still business. Like if, business. If, if Matt, I love Matt, I look for him and I'll always love him and I'll always look out for him. But if he quits working, I'm not going to keep paying him. Yeah. I'll still love him. He can go do whatever he wants to do. So I told him early on too, I said, look, I'm, I'm probably going to be pretty kind to you if things go well, that's how I am, but just, just respect the business. Cause I've had this situation too, where I was too nice to an employee. They start taking it for granted and they start acting like, you know, they're my brother, like, or something. And they're, they are my brother, but it's a business related. It's like a sports team. You don't get to be the aging star that gets paid the big bucks just because you used to be great. You have to remain great. And I have had people take advantage of that. So I have coached him on that too. And again, I think that helps too, of having all these mistakes in the past. I'm because I'm transparent. I'm basically able to lay out all the things that like, Matt, I, I can be a bottleneck, Matt. Um, don't take me for granted. Cause if you do, it'll piss me off, even though I'm going to always be pretty kind to you. Um, Hey, by the way, if I blow up occasionally in the heat of battle, just understand that I don't do that a lot, but I can be pretty ugly if I'm really in something and I feel let down. And so I'm going to apologize in advance and I'm way better than I used to be. Um, you know, there, there's all these conversations we're able to have that have built the framework for our relationship, but none of it will work if Matt wasn't all in or all out or whatever his license plate said, because that's just his personality. It's kind of my personality, personality too. And that's why we're a good match. Do you have any kind of like unwritten communication rules? Like they're not written out, but we have like, we don't go to bed mad or, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I, should, I should do that with my wife. <laughs> I, um, I, I told Matt when I hire him, I need, you need to be able to finish my sentences. You need to be telepathic. You need to think, you know, you need to know. You've done that on this call, actually. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah, he does that a lot. And sometimes to the point where I'm like, are you like, the only thing I've kept from Matt up to this point is my text. That's the last thing. And so I'll text, a business partner will text me like, something angry and he'll be like hey have you talked to that guy and i'm like are you looking at my text like, yeah yeah still a little, little like, suspicious you on my text? I'm like, no, but he's I'm looking at text. my text which is the last thing i try to keep private so i can send my wife little love texts or whatever and um he uh yeah he's it's almost like he is telepathic in a lot of ways so that's so yeah, we that's, had a question come in what is the one thing every visionary struggles to let go of and needs to let go of immediately 
Mm. Either one of you can take that. Yeah, I, well, my mine would be their schedule. I think everybody always wants to control their schedule. And David just is like, here's the rough guidelines that I want to try to follow. And I'm going to throw wrenches in it constantly, but it's my schedule and I'm allowed to do that. And he doesn't try to micromanage his schedule. He doesn't say, I don't want to meet that guy there. I don't want to meet that guy there. He may say something on the way, like, holy cow, this is a bad drive. And then I make a mental note not to send him that direction again, but he doesn't, he doesn't, he trusts me fully with his schedule. Yeah, I forgot about that. So with Matt, I basically, I look at my calendar each day and it tells me what to do. And it's usually, usually booked by that guy. He's really more my boss than I am. Um, so, you know, what do I need? Early on, it was just control. I just had such a high need for control before Matt. Um, I had this incredibly high need for control, but if you have complete control of everything, then you may as well have a company of two or three people. That's all you can have. You can't have a company of you can't be Warren Buffett and have a high need for control. You can't be Bill Gates. Now you can have a high demand for outcome and results. And there might be certain pieces you want to control. Um, but visionaries have to let go of a need for control and like lean into the vision at a very high level. And that's, um, yeah, you know, I'm really committed to health right now. So Matt books my, you know, my chef who comes and cooks healthy meals. And, you know, there, there's just, yeah. I mean, I've let go of my calendar. I don't know. There's much more I could let go of, but it enables me to. Apparently you're back. Oh, what's that? Apparently your text messages. Uh, right. Yeah, yep, they're next. Well, let's ask this one because this came in and I think it's a good question. Um, can you describe your philosophy and choice to live an abundant life? And how do you stay committed to that worldview when, the cha when you're challenged by setbacks and obstacles? So first off, life's very short. It seems long to us, but it's incredibly short. Um, the you know, I've got a very strong faith, but I'm not religious. So in my point of view, the God looks after the flowers and the birds and the plants and every year the rose blooms and then it dies. And that's just like, that's how life is. So, you know, if you know that it's going rough, like that's the petals falling off the rose, you should always know that there's going to be a bloom next spring. That's just the way it is. There's always a fall and there's always a spring. So, um, you've got to maintain that perspective that, that, that life wants you to be joyful. Life wants you to be bountiful. The, you know, the, the dogs, the puppy dogs run around and play the kid, you know, it's just like, that's what life wants for you is the best. And we are the only species I know of that can torture ourselves for days and days and days on something that happened a few days ago. Like no other species does that. And I've certainly done it. Um, I've just learned to let go. And I think the longer you're around life, the more you learn to let go. And it, and, yeah, that's the secret is letting go and letting the love and the abundance come in on a regular basis. And I do that through meditation, through prayer, uh, through releasing, and then through working out, which also helps. Love that. What about, so what task responsibilities um, do you not do, Matt? Or is it really everything? That's really that's crazy. No, that's crazy. <laughs> Sorry, what, what was your question? I'm sorry. Are there any tasks that you don't do besides texts? Is there anything like you're not supposed to touch or is it you're all in these days? I can't think of anything I'm not supposed to touch besides his texts. That's amazing. Because hey, man, I'll hide in my phone and say, go through all my texts and see what I've missed. Caught up on it. I just don't like, I just like having that one last refuge where right. I can have a private conversation with somebody, you know, like that Matt, what a freaking Matt. No, I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> um, so other than that, there's nothing. And he does a lot with my wife too. I mean, he makes her pretty happy. She tends to lean on him pretty hard too sometimes. And I'm I kind of like, hey, and we, we've got Matt has a has had an assistant. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, we got to fix that one too a little bit, you know, get him to have somebody that works and take some of the, I do get mad at him sometimes because he gets caught in the lower paid stuff. And I'm like, you're, you're worth way too much to be dealing with like waiting for a plumber to come fix the toilet or something that my, we, my wife and I both got upset about. And I've even had to talk to my wife about like, yeah, Matt's there for us, but you just can't lean on him all the time. Cause I need him to do what I, the high paid stuff that he's doing. Um, but no, I mean, we have a virtual assistant too. She does a lot of like the calendar. So I'll schedule everything and then forward it to her and have her add it to the calendar, add it to David's calendar, send Tracy an invite, don't send her an invite. So I get to manage a lot of that through her. So I do like the task, but I don't have to do the add it to the calendar, make sure the time zone's right, schedule somebody to come. She does all of that. So Matt, we had another question um, come in. Do you serve a mission or a person? Ooh. Well, that's good. That's a good question. Well, I think I serve honestly a mission and I got lucky enough that I now get to serve a person whose mission aligns with my mission. 
I've always wanted to live a big life an abundant life. And, and I remember when I first met David, I went home and, and told my girlfriend, well, obviously she's my wife now. And I said, I've like, I finally found somebody that thinks the way that I've always thought. I always thought I was weird or different because I had these crazy ideas of owning many businesses and doing all this fun stuff and having travel and passive income. And I met David and I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is, is, is what I've always wanted. And so I think like, for me, I'm serving a, per a person that happens to be on a similar mission that I'm on. And I would say that that goes back to one of your earlier questions. If you know life's short, you're probably never going to starve to death. It's unlikely. You're probably never going to be without shelter. So then we're just in the game. We're just playing this game to see what we can create. So it's more to me like a creativity art thing. Yeah, if the money went away, it would suck, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. It'd just be another opportunity to start over. And the other thing is that doesn't that means when it's big, you keep building it bigger, not because you need more money, but that's just the game you play, right? Can you give away more? Can I rate, make more? Can I help more people become multimillionaires? Can we do more good things for our investors? And that's the game I think we both get is like life's about expansion. It's not any, there's no destination. There's no specific win. It's just expanding in all areas at all times, health, family, commitment, giving back, um, all of that stuff. And I think Matt and I both share that, which is pretty cool. I love that. So David, it would be ridiculous for us to not ask you what things were you looking for when you found Matt? You know, what, what do people need to look for to find him? Because I mean, he, we, we talk about no purple unicorns here, but there are some, I think. <laughs> well, Matt's pretty special. I want to emphasize that I've had at least three great right-hand people before. Mm -hmm. um, I probably had eight total, um, but I can think of three that actually more. So always self-starter. I have to have self-starters. I need it. You need to show initiative. Somebody will just, you don't have to tell them what to do. And I've had the opposite where yet they waited till everything I told them what to do is the worst freaking thing in the world. Because mm -hmm. you know that if you don't specifically tell them A to Z or whatever, they are just going to stop. You tell them A to C, they're going to stop at C. You'd be like, what happened to DEF? They're like, we well, didn't tell me. So that's self-starter showing initiative is huge. Integrity, of course. I'm not looking for a saint, but I'm looking for somebody on the high end of the integrity scale. I don't expect perfection, but I certainly expect um, somebody to not lie to me, not cheat me, not stab me in the back, not you know make stuff up, not be dishonest, all the rest of it. So uh, that's integrity. Uh, a certain amount of intelligence. You can't you can't manufacture intelligence. Um, um, and then, you know, loyalty and loyalty to me is not blind loyalty. It's just loyalty. Like if somebody was making 60,000 and they get a $5,000 raise and they leave you, then that's in my opinion, disloyal. If they get a, a $120,000 raise, they don't leave you, then it's just stupid, right? They should leave you. Right. So there's, there's, when I say loyalty, I'm not talking blind loyalty. Uh, loyalty is like, Hey, this guy offered me 120. Um, you know, I got a young kid. I'd love to stay with you. Can we, can you get me to 90 or, you know, like that's loyalty. Disloyalty is, Hey, I'm leaving. Today's my last day. I know there's a bunch of shit going on, but you're on your own. Uh, that's disloyal. So from my point of view, that's the thing. Um, shooting it straight, be very direct with me. Um, yeah, and just have a work ethic. So I think those are the key components. Work ethic and initiative are kind of the same thing though. Yep. Well, an initiative just to expand on that really quickly, what, how would, how would you know that somebody's taking the initiative or self-starter? Like, how have you seen that show up before you've hired somebody? Well, first off, there's a very extensive hiring process we were trained on that we go through that uh, you can find that, you know, Dirk Van Reenen teaches it or Gary Keller teaches it, the recruit select process. Um, so assuming you've gone all that, like winning sh leaves clues, like generally speaking, people continue on a pathway after a certain period of time, mm -hmm. they continue on a pathway. So you need to make sure in the interview process that the path of the person has a success trajectory or a consistent action trajectory. Jim Rohn says it best. He says the Bible is full of stories and some of the stories are what not to do. And some of the stories are what to do. Just make sure when they write your story, your story is what to do. And so when you're interviewing somebody, you're looking, did they, if they failed, how did they come out of it? What was the win? Did they, are they growing as a human? Right? So in the interview process, but then when I hire people, I always tell them, look, this is a 90 day trial. I can, you can leave for any reason in 90 days. I can leave for any reason in 90 days. So I can fire you for any reason. Now. So now you got 90 days to test. And I just do a lot of tests. I just do up a lot of trial balloons. I, I don't know if it's the most scientific method, but I still find it the best method possible. I've tried being completely certain before that they were going to be perfect. And I just, other than throwing them in and saying, Hey, we got 90 days here to figure out if we're a match. 
And if we don't match, there's no big deal. It's not bad. The other thing I'll tell you, one of my favorite inter interview questions is, look, everyone wants a job. So when they're in the interview, they're doing their best to get the job. Even if the job was like the worst thing they could ever have, like it was the literally their definition of hell on earth during the interview, because you feel like you're getting rejected personally. If you don't get the job, you're like, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. C cleaning out. Yeah. Dental floss for t alligators. I've done that my whole life. I can. I got that. <laughs> and then they snap your arm off the first time you do it. Right. So I always try to tell people, look, don't say yes to this during the interview because you just don't want to be rejected. Just listen carefully what I'm saying. Like, mm -hmm. I might need you to change my kids diapers. I might need you to, you know, pick dog shit off the floor right before a party that we're having without even asking me, just take care of it. So if you can do all of that, you're also, there's going to be a lot of high level fun stuff too. But if you're, you know, if you think you can live at and then maybe just feed your dog a diuretic and see if it poops on the floor, how the person handles it. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> in 90 days, you're going to find out and you want to test that as hard as possible and see how they do in those situations. Because, I mean, second to my wife, Matt literally is the closest person to me on the planet. Um, and I'm very lucky to have him. And uh, obviously my kids too, I guess, my wife and kids. But as an Matt, adult- what were the three things that you were looking for when you were looking for a new opportunity? that keep you with David? Yeah, I was looking for someone with a big vision. So I like to think I have a big vision for my life. So as long as my vision can fit inside of his, I know we'll have a, a great relationship. I was looking for someone I could learn from, but not be micromanaged by. Like I wanted some autonomy to make mistakes and fail myself and, and correct those and, and learn from those, but also some guidance and some mentorship. And I also wanted to like figure out how to take my life to the next level. So I knew I wanted somebody that was like climbing the mountain or never satisfied, kind of like saying like, what else is possible? Um, life is great, but what else is possible? And, and David was kind of checking all of those boxes and just, I, I still remember like flying home from a, a trip I was on where I first or second met David and rewriting my five-year vision said, we live in Austin, Texas. I work for David Osborne and you know, the universe kind of aligned. He said, what would it take to get you to Austin? So um, I think, I think when you kind of know what you want in life, it, it shows up and that's what happened for me. And I was lucky enough to see my, Matt work at a couple conventions too. And he was always hustling. He was always working. You know, we do these GoBundance events where we'd have a go crew and he'd volunteer. They weren't getting paid anything. And then I'd notice another go crew member would screw up and Matt would not only fix their problem, but he'd be compassionate towards them. Like, Hey, I know this happens to everyone. Don't worry about it. I'll got, I'll take care of it. And even if they were use, more useless than, you know, anything, they just couldn't do anything. He still was really kind to him. He never really ripped into him. And I thought that's the kind of guy that I could use on my team. So I did, we did a vision exercise and literally uh, I didn't know he'd done that, but he'd written down that within five years, he was living in Austin working for me. And I, I called him up. Yeah. It sounds like a love story. Doesn't it? It doesn't sound real, but again, I think the groundwork I laid through all my other relationships in the personal assistant category, which now again, Matt's way more than that. He's more like the COO of my life mm -hmm. and business and personal, but, um, the, the groundwork was laid with just all those other relationships. And because I've been on a 25 year journey of entrepreneurialism and, and yeah, I've really been grateful for people who have worked for me, but Matt's next level. And I, I was fortunate enough to learn really closely from, from the lady before. And she was, she still is absolutely amazing. Still is an intricate part of David's world. And I mean, she took me under her wing. She, I mean, I remember the first day we got to Austin, she invited my, my wife and I to her house, made us dinner, like from day one, she took me under her wing and helped me really understand David at a high level and understand his world and taught me so many little like tips and tricks that I still use on, you know, calendar management, Excel, all of these things. Um, and, and so I, I mean, I got lucky that I, I got to work for David, but I also got lucky that I was mentored by her when I first got in the role. I don't know that I would be as successful if I hadn't learned from her failures and her, her tips and tricks as well. Mm. And I think for me, like, because I care about the people that work for me in a, in a high level, it doesn't show up like the way care would. It's not like I'm a big kind of warm teddy bear guy. It's just more that from a task point of view, I'm going to show you a lot of care. Like, how's that happening? Are you on track with that? Are you paying your mortgage? Do you have health insurance? Just little, that's how I think. So I don't think like, hey, how are your kids today? Oh, did your daughter sleep well last night? I don't do that as well, but I will be. I think people can sense that what I really care about is that their life is running smoothly on the tracks that they're trying to lay down. And that creates a certain amount of loyalty. I've had a lot of people stay with me for a long time. Um, but again, move around into different spots and things like that. And that goes back to that, just care a lot about your people. And it goes back to that idea that life is finite, that it's not really, the journey is not just to make the most amount of money possible. It's about kind of like this fully inclusive, abundant way of thinking and living. And I'm so grateful to Matt and Terry and people that look out for me because I'd be a mess without them. I mean, literally without Matt, I, my life would be a disaster.
Yeah. How often are you, so he's looking at your journals, looking at your emails. He's very in tune with your goals. How often do you have the reverse conversation about what his personal goals are and his business goals? And not as much as I should, but at least a couple times a year. Yeah. I'll tell him usually when I feel like it hasn't been a while, I'm like, Hey, send me your goals. Let's sit down and talk to him. I know we've done it at least once this year. I don't, it should be more often, but, um, but I'm also like a very private personal person. So I'm not very quick to share. So David would probably do it a lot more often if I was pushier, but I'm also like, we're here for a mission and we're on, we're on a mission. We're like going to battle every day. So I don't, I know that all of those things are kind of falling in line when we accomplish our mission. I'm not quick to say like, Hey, can you sit down? Can you help me? Can you guide me? He does it every single day. Most of the time without knowing it, he'll say like little things. Most of them are for himself, like about health or whatever. And I'm like, Oh, that's a good nugget. I'll pick that up. Or I say, oh, I read a lot about a five-day fast. I want to do a three-day fast. And then I'll make a note like, oh, I'm going to do a five-day fast. And I'll be like, why are you so extreme? And you know, in my mind, it's because I heard it from him. And, and that's what I want to emulate. So it's okay. it's more often, it's not necessarily formal, but it's it's it happens all the time. So he's leading you by example. Every day, yeah. Well, I'm committed to a really big life and an amazing life in all areas. And I think Gary Keller is too, which is one of my mentors. And you know, I I just try to be all I can and I'm Matt comes along and we're we're being all we can be together. Um, you know, and I've, I've looked through his goals before and been like, I think that's a dumb idea. And, you know, Matt, Matt's a little more stubborn than me. He's got to kind of figure stuff out himself. But like I said, he has an amazing family life. He keeps himself in really good physical shape. I know he's making pretty decent money. We could probably do better, but he's doing well. Um, the business side, we haven't created as many as I might have liked. He was all flipping properties back in Wisconsin, which went well at first and badly later. Um, <laughs> So, you know, we just got so much going on right now that if we can hit our business goals that we're trying to create, I think everybody will be fine. But uh, yeah, I'll occasionally ask him, do you have a will or stuff like that? But he just knows I care and we should, we should probably have a more regular thing. But like you said, Matt, Matt and I's biggest weakness is we don't communicate much on a regular basis. We just both get after it. And he, like, I did, I don't give him my journals. I just leave him around and he just goes through them. Like, so it's not like, I'm, it's not like I'm, Hey, let's have our business meeting for the day. It's more like he just picks it up and goes through it. Sometimes I'll say to him, Hey, I wrote a bunch of new stuff in my journal. And that's just my sign of saying sometime this week, pick it up and look at it. Mm, that's awesome. Well, we want to get you out of here a little bit early because we started a little early. So, so we're very thankful for your time. And I know that so many people are going to learn so much from this. So thank you for spending the time. Both of you, we know it's very valuable. Great to be with yeah, you, Lindsay you. and Christy. And it's fun to have Matt on because Matt yeah. is the invisible yeah. force behind me. So I'm super happy to see him uh awesome. with me it's good and how can people reach out to you if they have questions especially matt uh you can you can send uh you can reach find david at his website david at david osborne you can find me on facebook or even send me an email i can give you guys my email and you can put it in the comments awesome. so like way more common than guys like matt if you could find a hundred people like matt you would solve all the world's problems i think you need to buy the new uh domain name flinchlessmatt.com yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys so much. thank you thank so you, much thank you appreciate it thank Have you a great day. Bye -bye. thanks you too